Good morning. I'm reading from Galatians 3, verses 15 to 28. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law, introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God, and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions, until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impact life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith, in Jesus Christ might not be given, might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of the faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian, until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, for all of you were baptised into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jan. As we come to God's word, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray now as we hear it and we meditate on it, that we will hear you speaking to us and we will be obedient to you and bring you glory in our lives. So speak, Lord, and help us to listen. Amen. Why do we find it difficult to do what we know is right? The news this week has reported there's been a dramatic increase during lockdown in a number of children contacting helplines because of domestic abuse. We're aware of the ongoing exploitation through human trafficking, the damage we're doing to our planet through overconsumption, the continued unfair trade that leaves the poorest struggling for survival. The greed, the addictions, drugs, gambling, alcohol, porn, the falsehoods and lies, the use and abuse of others. Why do we find it difficult to do what we know is right? And despite huge advances in technology and knowledge and collective wealth, our morality still seems to have improved not at all. Human morality seems no further advanced than it was decades ago, even centuries back. There are many ideas as to why we fail to live as we know best. Some say it's a lack of education. It's ignorance. Others say it's a consequence of an oppressive environment, the conditions in which we're brought up in, the conditions in which we live. People behave like animals because they're treated like animals. Others say it's a result of a political system, maybe capitalism. If we could abolish greed, people would stop using and abusing each other. 
There are undoubtedly some truths in each of these explanations. But according to the Bible, the main cause of the human problem is sin. There is a rottenness in the makeup of each of us. Yes, we're made in the image of God. There is a goodness in us, but there is also this rottenness. The NIV describes it as a sinful nature. And it's that tendency in each one of us to choose wrong at times rather than what is right. And we cannot, no matter how much we try, live the life, the perfect life that pleases God. The solution is, is not better education. It's not improved social conditions or environment. It's not even the right uh, political philosophy. What we need is a solution that addresses sin, it addresses our fundamental nature. And our passage this morning that Jan has read for us, it's quite a complex passage, but I want to highlight just a couple of things. As Paul continues his argument about the Jewish law given by Moses, and his argument is the Jewish law can't save us. We said last week that Abraham trumps Moses. Abraham predates Moses by 400 years or so. Uh, and he's more important than Moses. And Moses came for a while and the law came for a while. But actually Abraham, with God's covenant, God's agreement with Abraham, that all nations would be blessed and drawn to him, is more important than God's covenant with Moses in this one particular nation. And it begs the question then, why Moses at all? Why the law at all? Why did God call this particular group, the Israelites, to be his own and give them the law if his plan all along was to bring the whole world back to himself? So what is the purpose of the law if it can't save us? The answer, according to our passage, is that it reveals the extent of our problem. Verse 19 says this, what then was, was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions. It was added for the sake of transgressions. God calls the Israelites to himself through Moses. He delivers them from oppression and slavery in Egypt. He watches over them on their journey to the promised land. He promises health and protection and blessings. He calls them his people, his treasured possession. He becomes their God, and yet despite all this, over and over again, they turn their backs on him. Despite all God's goodness and kindness and love and promises and blessings, they don't respond as they should. And the law reveals their transgressions. It, it reveals, it shows up that they keep doing wrong. The, the word transgression, which is used in our passage, literally means to cross a line. The law draws a line, and it reveals that we keep crossing that line. It says here, it was added because, for the sake of transgressions, it's to reveal the fact of our, our fundamental nature has a rottenness to it. So if, if I claim that I'm a superb driver, if I claim that I, I'm a great driver, I always drive really safely, actually, there's no way of proving that. I, I can believe that all I want. Until you put the law in, and the law tells me that I should drive at certain speed limits, that I should drive on one side of the road, that I should drive in certain ways. And what the law does in that situation is it shows me that actually I'm not as safe as I may claim to be. It highlights my problem. And the same is true of the, the law that was given to Israel. And, and if Israel can't keep the law, despite all that God has done for them, despite knowing God so well and being his people and his mercy and his grace, it reveals not just to Israel but to the whole of humankind how deep our problem is. It shows sin for what it is. As one preacher puts it, the law is the light that reveals how dirty the room is not the brush that sweeps it clean. And Paul goes a little further. He talks about the law as a jailer or a prison guard. Verse 22 says this, but the scripture, in other words, the law, has locked up everything under the control of sin. When I was 14, I was taken on a boat trip around the infamous American penitentiary, Alcatraz, known as the Rock, 
set up as a prison in 1934 in response to mob rule and gangsters. It was the prison from which you did not escape. 36 tried to during the 28 years it was operational. Seven were shot and killed, two drowned. Five were unaccounted for, presumed dead, and the rest were recaptured. It was the inescapable prison. And Paul's language here tells us that sin, this rottenness within each one of us, this tendency to live contrary to God's ways, is actually an inescapable prison. It holds us in bondage. And no matter how much we try, we cannot live the way we ought before God. For the Israelites, the law showed them their problem. It was a jailer that pointed out that they were in this predicament. And as it says in verse 23, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up. I wonder if you know the extent of our problem as human beings. I wonder if you understand our human condition. The tendency that we all have, no matter how much we try, that we cannot consistently do what is right. When I first encountered Christians my age, when I was 17, I was impressed by them, by their kindness, their honesty, their generosity, their care. And I decided I wanted to be like them. And so I tried to modify my behavior. I used to swear uh, quite a bit and I tried to stop swearing. Uh, I tried to be less obnoxious at home I tried to be kinder to my brother. I tried to be less critical of others in gossiping. And over a few weeks, I tried to do this and I kept finding I couldn't do it. I kept slipping into those old habits. And then on the 16th of March, 1986, for the first time, I yielded myself fully to the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that point, something changed within me and I found there was an instant change in some of those areas where things I couldn't change before, suddenly I could change. That the problem of sin in my life, that there was an unlocking, and I now had a freedom I did not have before. As Paul says here, I was no longer imprisoned to sin. And the law here is given to reveal the extent of our problem. And, and following on from that, it's given to lead us, therefore, to Christ. Let me read on in verse 23 and 24. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. It was a guardian for a while. That's the word that's used. It, this term guardian is translated in lots of different ways in different versions of the Bible. Some places it says it was put in charge of us. Another place it says it's our trainer, our tutor, our teacher, our schoolmaster. Probably the best term we have to, to understand the, the original word that's used here is it's our babysitter or our nanny. Because the term was actually used, it was, it's a term of a household slave in these Roman, Greco-Roman households who, who would have responsibility to look after the children, normally between sort of six and 17 years old. And this household slave would have to um, discipline them, get them to school on time, and, and the discipline would often be with a rod to correct them, to show them where they were wrong, preparing them for adulthood, maturity. And the idea here that, that Paul is, is in Paul's mind is that the law has this role within us. It's, it's to discipline us, to show us where we're wrong, but in order that we might reach maturity. It's to take us somewhere. And that's what Paul says. He says, the law has a place, but it's to take us somewhere, and it is to lead us to Christ. The law was our guardian until Christ came. The law itself doesn't save us. It didn't save them, but it showed them they needed to be saved. As John Stott writes, it is only against the inky blackness of the night that the stars begin to appear. The law shows our problem, the darkness, which then enables the solution to be seen. And it brings us to the final point. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the saviour. Verse 26 and 27. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. 
For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. I learned a remarkable thing this week. You may know this already. Um, and it was uh, from uh, Scottish shepherds um, that they have a technique to enable an orphaned baby lamb to be accepted by another you. Youths will reject lambs, not their own, because they do it by smell. And if, if they can smell that this new lamb that's been introduced to them isn't their own, and then they won't look after it, they'll reject it. And so the shepherds, they, they look for another lamb that has died. And they take that lamb, and they, it's quite gruesome. They cut off the skin of the dead lamb, and they make a jacket out of it. And they cut holes, a hole for the neck and four holes for the feet. And then they, they poke the, the newborn baby lamb who's lost its mother into that jacket. This is a, a picture of, uh, of one lamb that has had this with the, the skin of another lamb put upon it and the, the fleece of another lamb. And then they introduce it to the mother of the dead lamb. And uh, smelling the familiar smell of her own lamb, she will usually accept the orphan lamb. Here's another lamb where this is, has happened. What God offers us through Jesus is to clothe us with Christ, the lamb that was slain. He makes us acceptable to the Father. We, we relate to God, we can come close to God, not because we're acceptable in our own right, but because we are clothed with Christ. We are dressed in Jesus. And on the basis of his relationship with the Father, we can have a relationship with the Father hidden in him. The Bible uses a, a phrase often which talks about us being in Christ. It, it's a remarkable phrase. The idea that we are located in him, we're included in him, we're incorporated into him. And that's what it says in verse 27. It says, all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You've been baptised into him. We're, we're in unity with each other and with Jesus. We are found in him. We have become a member, a part of him. And therefore we enjoy the relationship he has with the Father only by being located in him. Jesus is the one who restores our relationship with, with the Father and who overcomes our problem, which is sin. So what is the purpose of the law? If God's main plan was through Abraham, why did we have Moses? Why did we have the law? Why did we have Israel? The law was given to Israel. It couldn't save, but its purpose was to show us that even those who experience the most profound and wonderful blessings and presence of God, as Israel did, are still not able to live the life God wants them to live. It shows us the human condition of sin is so profound, so encompassing that none of us in ourselves can escape it. It shows us we need a saviour. As someone has written, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was sin, so God sent us a saviour. Jesus Christ is our saviour. Put your faith in him. And as we do so, we are included in him, covered by him, and accepted into God's kingdom. Let me close with a quote from John Newton. John Newton was the 18th century slave trader who became a Christian. Uh, he wrote uh, the, the very famous hymn, Amazing Grace. His tombstone reads this. It says, John Newton, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, who was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had la long laboured to destroy. At the age of 82, nearing his, his death, Newton said this, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great saviour. That's what Galatians 3 is all about. 
It tells us we are a great sinner, but it also tells us that Christ is a great saviour.